The topic now is cryogenics, cryogenic detector for dark matter. So basically, I will start with well the basic principles. And then I will come back on these basic principles, phonon, a little bit of scintillation, and, and then uh, a bit more on ionization. Because uh, as usual, you, when you present the basic principle, and it's you present it in useful way, but it's usually not entirely true. And then I will go in, so in the three separate uh, phonon scintillation and part, I will go back and, and try to get a bit more precise and say things in a way that are a bit less false. And then uh, I will maybe if we have time, maybe we can have a few words about cryogenics. But uh, we'll see if this uh, happens. Okay, so coming for, uh, to um, if you want to have more details, uh, you what I will say is at the level of basic introductory uh, books uh, like uh, the, the the null book on radiation detection and measurement, where it's a very good basic. Uh, I will talk about a little bit about solid state physics, even though I, I must say I'm not really a specialist of solid state physics. Um, so if you want to uh, really uh, get the things correctly, you go back to your detail. And uh, as far as um, if you want to have more details on different experiments, I think it's always nice to, to go and visit the site of different experiments. There's a very good conference for cryogenic detector, which is the LTD conference, which has very nice slides uh, on uh, every two years. The, the, there's one this year, the, and I just gave you an example of the other one. And of course, for dark matter specific uh, results, uh, you should consult, for instance, the IDM conference site. I will be very skimpy on the results. I will be basically uh, spending a lot of time describing detectors. Uh, cryogenic detectors, I will stick many other application of, uh, of uh, cryogenic detector, uh, where these uh, sub K, uh, when I talk about cryogenic detector, it's a bit of a misnomer because it's many detector are called, but in our case, we are talking about detectors that are working below, typically below the, the Kelvin, uh, between 10 millik to 100 millik. But these detectors have also big impact, and for instance, in CMB measurement, infrared uh, astro, uh, astrophysics, and also uh, massive detector are very important for a the double decay uh, without neutrino, and also in neutrology, and all this will be skipped. So we're talking about dark matter, and that was uh, that plot was more or less presented in different way in previous plots where. What we want to have is a detector that uh, wants to probe uh, a, a signal from dark matter and the kinematics of the, the, the signal we will get, the transferred energy depend on the target uh, of, uh, that you have. And also it depends whether you're, you're scattering on electrons or on a, a nucleus. But what is more important is uh, of very often is what is the basic uh, threshold you have. And um, if you just draw this horizontal line here at 3 EV, which is the average energy needed to create an electron hole pair in germanium, we could say that this more or less sets a limit on what kind of dark matter mass you can probe with a germanium detector. And you can already see a little bit of why it's interesting to look at solid state detectors is that they have smaller gaps, smaller energy needed to have a one quantum excitation. And uh, so uh, germanium as a scale of 3 V, we'll see it's not exactly true, but uh, uh, in silicon is 3.8 EV, which is lot lower than what you would have ultimately in, for instance, creating a, 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 a scintillation in, in uh, xenon uh, as well that was discussed uh, this, this morning. So if we really want to look at low mass uh, dark matter particles, 
uh, threshold is very important, and that's where cryogenic detector are, are bound to play a, a, an interesting role in already uh, doing a lot of um, headway. So before talking about the, the signal, I mean, the, 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 the experimental field of, of dark matter search with cryogenic detector is really dominated by the question of background. Fortunately, there was a lot of a very nice description in the previous talk of all the different backgrounds we can get. And um, uh, the, the question is the same here, except that, of course, we will be interested in the, in the, the, in the backgrounds at very low energy. Now, solid state detector are small and are, uh, they, they don't benefit from the cell shielding that big, uh, huge xenon or argon detector can have. So usually we'll have uh, a remain, uh, remaining background. It's much tougher to, 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 um, to fight the backgrounds when you have a, uh, not the benefit of shell shielding, but we want to compensate that by the ability of discriminating the different backgrounds and uh, getting very pure uh, detector. So I will not go back around this list of, of what kind of background we have to fight for, but remember that a lot of the detector design is not is, is tuned for the signal, but also tuned uh, to get as little background as possible and have a way to discriminate it. And therefore, what the detector I will talk about, they don't exist in, in they don't float in, 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 in air. They really are inside a complex uh, structure of different shield. Um, and uh, the shields are to protect the detector from the outside environment, uh, but they also uh, they are to protect for from the in immediate environment, for instance, the front end electronics. That's always a question. You might have a very nice detector idea, but if the electronics is, is very radioactive and you cannot get it, um, uh, you cannot protect yourself carefully, then you don't have a good detector. And of course, you, you want to work with as clean, as clean material as possible right from the start. Now, let's go to the signal now. Okay. Um, we've seen that there, yeah, we have basically two types of, of, of signal that we can have, electron recoil and nuclear recoil. Now, when we started, when I started the field, it was, we, it was, uh, uh, guaranteed to me that uh, the signal would be a nuclear recoil and that any, anything that would be an electron recoil would be just background. And now we are living in a world now where uh, a dark matter signal could be on, electron, on the electron recoil side and, not, and, and, and then the background would be nuclear recoils. So it's a good thing that uh, you have to understand both type of signal very carefully because uh, any of the two can be a signal and, and uh, you have in any way in order to fight the backgrounds you really have to understand how an electron recoil and a nuclear recoil uh, behave in your detector. So electron recoil is something that looks fairly, fairly simple. Uh, you start with a and uh, but even if you have a photon, the first thing that the photon will do is create an electron. It's, it's the electron that you will, the primary electron that you will have a good chance of de detecting the, the, init the initial energy of this re uh, electron recoil. Now, this recoil will stop in the, your detector and this energy loss will create, in the case of electron, it will create ionization. Now you could say that electron will essentially give all, up all its energy to other electrons in a crude approximation. Uh, it doesn't create defects. It doesn't create, uh, it cannot dislodge a, um, an atom, especially in a crystal. So all, what comes inside the electron channel will stay in the electron channel. And you could say, okay, so the electron only has to care about the other electrons and how it, it uh, gives it its energy to the other electrons. It's not entirely true because the way electrons are, uh, are, are, are getting, out, uh, getting 
rid of their energy is a lot through phonon interaction and phonon interaction play a lot of, of uh, a, a non negligible role in understanding what happens in the slowing down of the electron. So this slowing down is uh, typically uh, of the order of, of less than a microsecond. And then what you're left with after the electrons have stopped moving and giving up all the energy to the, the environment, to the, 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 in our case, to the crystal, then you have phonons that will start with high energy, go down in energy and eventually thermalize. Now, then if you have just this, these arrow, then you don't lose any energy and therefore all the initial equal energy goes into thermal phonons and to a, a heat and you can measure uh, in a cryogenic detector, you can measure the, the temperature uh, uh, increase due to this arrival of an energy. Now, this is not entirely true because there will be some of the ionization energy that will be converted into scintillation. Uh, and uh, depending on the material, it can be a few percent. Uh, and, um, but uh, in the case of germanium and, and silicon, I, the, the um, uh, scintillation is not, uh, uh, is, is not really something that we have to worry about. Now, nuclear recalls is much more difficult to, to follow. You have two different paths. You will also have that the initial recoil energy is not a, an, a, an electron, but it is an atom. And of course, this atom will lose some of its energy through the excitation of, of, of electrons. Let's call that ionization production, and it can produce a charge. Uh, in uh, and as in um, for an electron, you you will create electron hole pair in a semiconductor, and also also some of it can go through scintillation. But since the initial particle is, part, is, is one atom that is part of the lattice, it's obvious that the lattice will be disrupted by this uh, sudden move uh, of uh, this sudden recoil. And this will push much more, a bigger part of the energy directly into what is called the, um, the nuclear uh, stopping power, which is basically uh, the, that the energy goes directly to the late lattice or it goes directly to the, to the displacement of other atoms and other ions. Now, since the phonons are exactly, um, uh, are, a phonon is just a, a, a term to explain the, 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 the degree of freedom of the, of the lattice vibrating, then this means that uh, a nuclear recoil is very efficient at putting a lot of energy in the, at, in the phonon channel. And these, again, will, you will start with high energy phonons, low energy phonons, and then eventually everything thermalized. But if you look, um, one basic difference uh, as, as that can be seen is that the fraction of ionization that the nuclear recoil will produce will be uh, typically 10 to 20 to 30 percent that of an electron recall of equal energy. So this is already a way to, to identify what kind of recall you have in your detector. Again, you, you have, okay, the scintillation. But in the case of nuclear recall, you have another thing that you have to worry about, which is that um, since you, you, you break a little, a little part of your crystal by doing that, you you will create defects in your, uh, in your crystal and you have to worry a bit, a, a little, when you want to be very, very precise, you have to worry that part of the energy will not go into these nice colored path, but into some hidden path not written here, which is permanent defects in your crystal. So the, the previous plot was the way to introduce when you have a detector, usually you don't just use heat signal or phonon signal. Uh, you also want to combine that with ionization and scintillation. And uh, so there's basically two reasons when you want to use cryogenic detector, your choice will be based on two arguments. The first one will be the one of resolution or threshold. 
This is related to how much energy is needed to, uh, one way to look at it is how much energy you need to, to create one quantum of, of, uh, of excitation that you can detect. Now for scintillation, it depends on the material, but typically um, if you want to produce a one EV photon, you need to put in the system something like, ideally it would be 10, 20, but more, more realistically, you have to put in the system 100 EV in order to have the chance to see a one EV photon to get out to, to, to be detected. For ionization, um, then the number is smaller, uh, to create an ionization in, in the, you can go down in certain, in certain gas to 10 EV. And, and we saw that in a semiconductor, you can get only one EV is enough to create something of the order of one EV is enough to, to create an excitation, which is in, our, in this case, uh, electron hole pair. Now in the case of the, the phonon signal, uh, the, the heat is based on the population of phonons. These phonons are, are a bit tricky to, to count. Uh, typically, people say that, well, if you would have to, to, to symbolize uh, this, you would say that your quantum are of the order of MEV, which means that you can think of detector, cryogenic detector with extremely low threshold, much lower than anything need that, that, that would be able to, to dislodge an electron. You're sensitive to energy deposit that are so low that they don't even ionize. So that is interesting, but at the same time, it opens the, the fact that your detector will be a bit more sensitive to any kind of, of background. So this is the, the resolution is an important factor in, in choosing a cryogenic detector. And then we already said another one is that you can do by combining your heat measurement, which is um, uh, with another measurement to have a particle identification with the goal, uh, the obvious goal in the case of uh, nuclear recall is that you can in that way uh, isolate nuclear recall relative to uh, electron recall. So a rough picture of ionization is just uh, of the ionization ch channel is just that you have to create electron hole pair and you want, you want to collect them. So you will apply an electric field on both sides of your, your detector, and you will collect a certain number of charge, and the signal will be, just be uh, the, the, the charge that you have collected, and you, you will take a gamma ray source to calibrate your detector and give a correspondence between energy and charge. Uh, to give an idea, if you have a 10 kV nuclear recoil, you will have uh, some inef inefficiency in creating electron hole pair, but you will still nevertheless create something like 800 whole electron hole pairs, which is a, a fraction of femtocolon. That's that's something that you can measure, and also the fluctuate the statistical fluctuation on this 800 is smaller than just Poisson statistic because there's a correlation the way that the this this energy is shared between the different particle is something that is um, uh, that is correct. So therefore you, you have not the one over square root of N uh, the, uh, res uh, relative resolution on the signal, but you have a, a reduction, which is called the Fano factor. So the main problem with this measurement is that you are limited by the readout noise. Basically, if you have a capacitance, then you will have the noise, a related to the fact that you have charge fluctuation on this big capacitance. So the bigger the detector, the bigger it will be the, 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 the noise that you add from your readout. And that is the noise that you will have to fight. So of course, if you have a smaller detector, it has a smaller capacitance, and then you can hope to have a better resolution. And this is one way to improve. Uh, people are working on getting better ionization resolution. And um, of course, here in this nice picture, all the charge have been collected, but of course you can lose charge if you have imperfection traps in your detector, then you will lose some of the charge and that will affect your signal, but you, are, you want to design a detector that doesn't have this problem. A rough picture of scintillation is this, you just create uh, scintillation photons, you just 
and then you put a photo sensor that looks at that, collects as many photons as you can, and then the signal is just how many photo uh, electron that you uh, can uh, detect here. Um, yeah, and then the problem, of course, you have a smaller number of quanta, you will have more Poisson fluctuation on your signal. There's no fan factor uh, to, to help you in this case. But one thing which is an advantage is uh, that the photosensor can be completely separated because the, 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 the photon can travel through vacuum and, and get in your photosensor. So it's quite nice property that you, you, you decouple the optimization of your absorber to the optimization of your photosensor and that, that, uh, that it has no physical contact. And that's important, for instance, for a, uh, a, a um, uh, uh, cryogenic detector. Now, the, now let's come to the uh, what is a rough picture of the heat or phonon signal, uh, and why do I talk about heat and phonon? Um, so, first of all, if you just say that you have a, some energy delta uh, delta E deposited in an absorber that has a, a heat capacitance C then the temperature, the rise of temperature of your absorber, if it's isolated, will be a delta E over C. Uh, so if you choose something, uh, an absorber that has a very small heat capacity, you will have a, a large increase of temperature, even if you uh, have a small energy deposited. Um, so the, what you have is you just to glue a, thermo, a thermometer on your absorber, and uh, that's one way to do it. Um, but the phonons, we, we, I talked about phonons, yeah, phonons a different kind, we'll come back to that. And uh, you can try to start to count phonons even before they get uh, ter fully thermalized. Uh, one obvious reason you want to do that is that you will get a faster detector. You don't not have to, to, to wait for the millisecond it takes for the, the full detector to thermalize. So it's a faster detector. And also you can get some position sensitive device. Uh, we'll come back later to that. So if you want to, to catch the, the phonon before they're thermalized and you, 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 meet, you need a detector that will, whose ability to detect a signal will depend a little bit of how much surface they have. So they must have enough surface to, to, to catch phonon, but not too much to uh, destroy the signal too soon. So you go back to your, if you want to have a very low capacitance, then you go back to your solid state book and you learn that the first thing you want to do is that uh, to lower the, the heat capacity of uh, an object is that first of all, you want to freeze the, elect the electron. You want them to be in all in the, uh, you don't want to have any electron in your, your conduction band. You want to have an insulator. That way the, the degree of freedom of the electron do not contribute to the capacitance. And then it's only the, um, the vibration of the crystal that will, de 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 that will determine your, your degree of freedom that contribute to your heat capacitance. And then the dependence is on T cube. And um, so at low temperature, germanium silicon is isolated. Uh, they have the bike temperature of 374. 4K, so it means that when you, you compare T, you compare to that temperature and you put that to the cube. But of course, if you have some, uh, a, most, a much stiffer uh, late lattice like sapphire, uh, then you have a higher temperature corresponding to the highest uh, excitation of the crystal. And then you have, uh, an e you can get an object that has an even smaller uh, capacitance. So with this scheme, you can get a micro Kelvin signal on a kilogram absorber. And then this is an old slide. At that time, the baseline resolution can be as good as 20 or 50 EG on a kilogram scale. But now we, uh, we're aiming for the few EV by cheating a little bit on the mass, but, but we can get to a few EV uh, precision on, on that kind of measurement. Also, it's interesting to take the time to explain why sometimes we call these detector bolometers. And sometimes, um, even though if you are very strict about it, a bolometer should be measuring a flux. And in fact, 
this scheme of, of, of putting a, a, term, a, term, a term distance on, on, a, on a sensor to measure the temperature to get a signal can be used in two different regimes. If you have a continuous flow of flux of radiation, for instance, if you are in Planck and you want to measure the CMB radiation, then you just have a, um, your sensor, you, it's coupled to the heat path through a, a, a heat, conductance, uh, heat conductance G. And then what will happen is that if you expose uh, through uh, some horn, you expose this, the, 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 the absorber to the flux coming from one region of space, you will see the, the, uh, the, the, the infrared photons coming on your absorber and heat it up. And then you will see uh, when you, you point your detector on your source, you will see that this flux just raise the temperature of your absorber. And uh, the, the speed at which you establish this equilibrium is just uh, the ratio of how big is your capacitance and how big is your heat link. And then you have a stable state. And this is polarimeter. You measure flux, a flux in, in, uh, in watt. And uh, so the G factor is important. This is how you, you connect the, um, the, the noise will be a noise expressed in power. Now, in dark matter, we want to look at discrete particle. We don't want to integrate. So we want to see each particle individually. So therefore, we, we are in a different regime where we want to the, um, uh, you, you, you want to make the detector reset each time a particle hits the detector, the absorber, it will it will eat it up. But then you have a faster thermal link to the bath, so therefore the detector goes back to the bath temperature with a time constant, which is again c over g. Uh, so the elevation of temperature is e over c, but it goes back to equilibrium at a time capacitance over conductance. And then uh, you will have that your the height of your signal is just the energy divided by the, the heat capacitance, and uh, the, this here this G factor is just uh, the, the, the conductance is just a way to reset your detector to be ready for the next particle, and you're, you will have a noise that will depend on the C parameter uh, and. And uh, so you say that, okay, now it's quite clear that what we are using for dark matter it should be called a calorimeter. So we should call our detector a calorimeter, but, but since calorimeter is used in high energy physics for other detectors that are completely not calorimeter, but measurements of ionization and, and, and photon. Uh, and uh, so therefore a lot of time we use bolometer for these detectors, which are in the calorimetric way, but that's, that's the way things are. So now we want to combine that with a measurement of ionization uh, or light. Uh, uh, um, and uh, so in, in a semiconductor, uh, you create charge. And each, each time you want to create an electron hole pair, you must um, you must put some energy in the system. Now, now this, you could think that the smallest energy uh, that is needed to uh, create one electron hole pair would be the gap. Uh, and uh, that was already presented earlier that uh, in a semiconductor, this is uh, silicon and this is, uh, this is germanium, this is silicon. Uh, you have a, a gap between the, the, the last uh, level uh, the Fermi level and the first the first level for conduction, and in the Brillouin space you have uh, uh, that if you want to to do this excitation, not only you have to to excite, give energy, but also momentum because the minimum here is not in the same momentum space in the same Brillouin uh, axis than than the the, the ground state the, the ground state here, and. Um, but then nevertheless that okay in terms of energy you would say okay i just need to have an energy gap to to put one electron into the conduction and make an electron hole pair um 
but when you um, want to excite this, uh, you, you it's not it's not easy to do it because again you 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 have to move electrons sideways in the brillouin space. And now usually what we we do when we pump energy in the system, we put a lot of energy and we we come down from the top here, and 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 uh, the uh, excited electron will try to go down as far as they can. They will try to go as far down as possible, but they will always have keep a little bit of kinetic energy and also phonon. There will be a they will be in equilibrium with phonons. Conduction electron are continuously exchanging um, um, energy with with phonons in this in the system and this is how uh, for instance they they heat up the electron will heat up the the system is that they 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 just interact with with the phonon and so wh what it means that when you excite when you, you when you have this 3d per, per to create one pair electron hole pair in germanium means that in, you uh, this 3d 0 0.7 of that is is to uh, you, uh to to for the gap and the rest is just some equilibrium population where you have some kinetic energy and some phonon energy that is there and uh, which which is the majority so it is possible to excite an electron if you do a photoelect photoelectric effect you can excite in uh, a pair just with 0 0.7 or in silicon 1.2 EV. But if you come from above and you have some kind of disorder, you will have an equilibrium with a phonon population that, that says that you will, you will not be able to uh, create uh, um, uh, that all the, the, all the electron hole pair will have exactly the same gap energy as excitation energy. You always have this, this, this phonon and uh, okay, one. So, since this number here depends on phonons energy, kinetic energy, it, it has a temperature dependence. But fortunately, um, if you look at, for instance, uh, measurement done at, at uh, in semiconductor at uh, nitrogen, have a KT of 0 0.006 eV, which is a small number, and we are at 20. Uh, which is already a small number. So going to a KT of 0 0.06 to a, uh, a temperature which is a thousand times smaller is just a small, as a small impact on these number. And the, these number change as you, you go from uh, 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 liquid nitrogen to uh, 10 milliK, but not that much. So it's a small correction. You have to take that into account, but it's a small correction. So, if you want to create photoelectron instead, uh, instead, that not only do you have to create ionization, but these, these, um, you, you, you must have um, a, a way to uh, that this uh, scintillation be uh, put, uh, that these electron create a scintillation, and the, the yield of that depends on the this the. the depend on the, how many scintillating, scintillating centers you have in your crystal. It depends on the density of the energy deposition. And um, these kinds of constant have more time, uh, have more temperature dependence. And uh, we'll come back. If, if you want to have the discussion of that, we have to go into more detail. We'll do that, we'll do that later if we have time. Okay, so we, um, it looks like the, uh, the thermal measurement looks much simpler. You just measure the total energy. Uh, you could think that the thermal energy doesn't need to have all the details of how exactly you put the energy in the system. Do you go to reionization, phonon, and so on? Because uh, if you apply the two laws of thermodynamics, then you, you immediately see that if your detector is an isolated system, you have energy conservation. So whatever energy you put in at the beginning, the process is that breaks down this energy into a thermal energy. It's, it's as long as it's conserved, you don't have a problem. You will measure by temperature what you have put in, in the beginning. And the second law of thermodynamics that say that in, in any case, all the energy that you put in, 
all the free energy you put in will eventually uh, get thermalized, so you will get everything. And you don't have to worry about the details of physics. That's a great thing about thermodynamics. You, you, you just look at the, the big equilibrium and you don't care about the, the, the small mechanism. Of course, this is an ideal case. Uh, we saw, for instance, that uh, if your detector can sentiate, some energy will escape. So yes, you're, you don't have perfectly closed system, but that's, that should be easy. If you, you, you tag the photons, you can put them back uh, as, as they do, for instance, in, um, in the ionization, sentiation de uh, detector in xenon. And, but um, let's look at ionization. Is ionization perfect so fits well in this perfect world well uh, if you have no collection field which means that all the ionization you, you produce the the electron hole don't don't have time to travel very far they will eventually recombine after a certain time so if you wait long enough and and in a ntd measurement you you, you measure for uh, you wait for one millisecond then everything recombines and so therefore all the energy pumped into this uh, e gamma or just the gap also comes back in the end and, and you, you you add it in your total energy measurement you can worry at the beginning when people applied fields to bolometers they started to worry about the fact that uh, if you collect the charge and you you you, you don't get back the the gap energy but but if you collect the charge in an electrode which is glued or it's just in direct contact in thermal contact not glued but in thermal contact your detector then you'd gain that, that then your electrode is part of your closed system and you gain back there you don't have to worry you will gain back that energy but what you can worry about is if you your collision is not just due to an electron, but is, is your collision is due to the impact of a recoil in the nuclear recoil, then you can have permanent damage, which lasts for much longer than you're collecting your thermal your thermalization time, and then that energy will escape. And uh, also charge trapping, sometimes you can charge some electron hole pair cannot can can uh, fail to be collected properly, they, they end up on traps. And they stay there for a long time. And if they stay for, for a time longer than a few milliseconds, then it, they escape your thermal measurement. And then you escape the perfect world. So you have to control that in order to, to get the detector as close as possible to the ideal world. So let's go now to the concept of quenching. Quenching is just that uh, we saw that for Ionization signal, you have a difference between electron recoil and nuclear recoil. And for scintillation, you have also different yield of light depending on what type of particle is recoiling. So, uh, but this is this can be applied to do the particle identification, nuclear versus electron recoil. Um, so the 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 using the phonon or char uh, the charge or scintillation signal. Um, is um, the choice depends a little bit on what well, we have different advantages. Uh, the, the quenching here makes a better, uh, a easier signal to measure than scintillation, but at the same time, scintillation is more versatile because you, you can have, you can have in, in the, you're not stuck to just using semiconductors. So there are, you have advantage and disadvantage on the two method. And, um, so the, um, the the question was was asked uh, what about uh, position uh, looking at the position of the recoil um, part of the quenching come from the interaction of nuclear recoil on, on in the lattice and as said uh, in in solid state detector the range of here a 10 kV uh, silicon or germanium recoil inside the latest silicon or germanium is, is very short 10 millimeter 20 millimeter and this is already quite a high energy for a recoil and you see that it's very hard to figure out where well you get a small idea that the recoil came from this side but uh, you have to have a lot of imagination these are molecular dynamic simulation of nuclear recoils. And um, from that, you already get the picture that 
it's quite difficult to uh, to, um, to 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 get a, a, a position out of that. Uh, you could think that, uh, and for instance, you don't clearly see here any effect of the of the regular late lattice that uh, maybe would have some. Uh, the fact that your detector has a lattice with, with a certain geometry doesn't really seem to affect what is the energy, the, the dispersion of the energy, this deposition in terms here of, of how many uh, these are displaced atoms that are displayed. This is the displaced atom right when the event is, is just after the collision. And then in these uh, simulation, you can look at what happens when you let the system relax, because this, of course, is, is a small amorphized piece of your detector. You've, you've destroyed your crystal in this region, but the, 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 the semiconductor will, since it's, it's locally hot, will heal itself back to, uh, and most of the atoms will come back to, uh, to, uh, to where they, they to a, a good place in the latest, excess some of them. And this is the stored energy that we have to worry about. It's very difficult to evaluate because you have to evaluate what is, how much annealing you have uh, in, the, in the case where your atoms, the, this, this overheating is local. It, it could be something like percent, but it's very, very difficult to, to evaluate. Um, so, okay, the DADX question, uh, I guess people are familiar with this, that uh, this question of nuclear recoil and electron recoil, you have different mechanism. Uh, this has, has been calculated in the 60s, uh, just on the basic of, of just the, the, the constant of how much the DADX, how much DADX you have in the nuclear recoil system and in the electron, you, you can do a quite, good calculation of how this evolves with energy uh, with as, assuming simple form uh, for the uh, stopping power, uh, nuclear stopping power and electron stopping power and by the ratio of the two. And this is the famous uh, Lindart uh, uh, theorem that just uses a self cascade where as, as you lose energy, you sample different values of the, the relative to stopping power, and anything that goes into the nuclear stopping power goes into uh, phonons, and anything that goes to electron goes to creating ionization, and then you get a ratio of ionization to total energy from, from this calculation. Uh, if you want to have something more precise, you, you take the program SRIM that actually uh, use this, but in a in a kind of Monte Carlo way to, to, to describe fluctuation from cascade to cascade there. You have a huge fluctuation. Uh, Linda knew that is from his formalism, the fact that this stopping power comes from this street collision, then you should have large fluctuation from event to event. Uh, well, not large, but sizable. And uh, the, the, this effect should increase as you go down to energy. This was already in uh, in the back of the mind of this model, although people usually just take the average value that's predicted by this model. If you want to have more full picture, you, you, you there are some uh, programs to simulate that. And of course, this this uh, Lindar model has been uh, as as received some critique. You 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 would in the Lindar model, there's no natural scale for the minimum energy. Uh, here, already in the 60s, this was debated. People were looking for a re the region where the, this, this, uh, this uh, prediction of the theory for the quenching would break down. This is it, usually quenching is just a power law, almost like a power law, but it should break down at some energy. People were expecting it to break down at something like 100 EV uh, because that's when uh, you, you, uh, your kinemat kinematics forbid you to uh, excite one electron or pair, uh, and it should be something like 100 dV for a uh, germanium recall in germanium. But there are some arguments that, yes, uh, this, this argument is, is just for binary collision for uh, in a crystal, you can actually extend uh, the Linda theory is, 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 is wrong, but in a good way, and therefore it predicts the right tendency you don't have the threshold but we do expect at 
one point we have a threshold in our measurement trying to, 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 to check that. And there's some controversy of where, where you, whether we see it in Germany or Silicon and so on. I don't have much time to talk about it, unfortunately. So this is a simple way to look at the, uh, the signal. Now let's try to see whether we've already, we still have made approximation that need to be uh, um, uh, addressed. And first let's look at what is, how can you really measure temperature uh, in, in, uh, at low temperature? How do, you, how do you do that? You want to have extremely sensitive sensors, a temperature sensor. You, 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 you reduce your physics and just, I have a resistance, I want to measure it. And that's a resistance that depends on temperature. And one of the uh, very good term, term, term distance that you, you can use at low energy at 10 millik or down to 5 millik is called a anti germanium NTD, a neutron transmutation dope germanium. You take a germanium, a small germanium crystal, you expose it to a strong neutron flux that will create a lot of defects. And then you just stop at the at the moment where this um, the the transition from being uh, a semiconductor with the typical 50 ohm uh, resistance to something very resistive because it's completely amorphous depends strongly on temperature it has a the it's follows the ethros law which is a square an exponential of a square root of some reference temperature uh, divided by the temperature of your uh, of the electron that are flowing through your NTD. And uh, it, it's a logarithmic curve. And therefore that's, that provides quite, uh, quite sensitive uh, term, uh, resistance. Now, typically these will have resistance of the order of one ohm to 100 mega ohm, which is a bit of a problem because you, when you want to measure a signal on a big resistance, you will be stuck with small current and then you have to worry about the noise, but okay, these, these are things that we can manage. Uh, things are cold, so you can control, uh, you, you, you reduce the noise by being extremely cold. cold. But uh, also you have to take care that in order to measure a resistance, you have to flow a, a, a current through it. So of course, since you want to have a, a uh, a, a fixed resistance point, you will, you will flow a constant current in your resistance that will produce a, a bias uh, on the NTD, which is just the current you put in times the resistance. And therefore by measuring this, this bias between the two ends of the NTD, you measure uh, the, the, knowing the current, you have the resistance, and then you want to look at the variation of the resistance as as your, your particle just come, comes up. So the resistance will go down when the particle comes back and then uh, the detector will go back to the thermal bath. Now these are cheap and simple, uh, the, the uh, typical size of NTDs, just a few millimeter per, per millimeter with the height of a fraction of millimeters, small thing. You can do them by exposing a large chunk of germanium, a slab of germanium, and uh, produce mass produce them in the thousand, a few thousand uh, easily. And um, and these are typical pulses. You 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 have a thermalization that is of the order of one millisecond, and this scale here is in time. So, in or, uh, in order to really have a, a a, a, a good measurement of the temperature, you want to slow down your, your, your term, the, you need to slow down your, your, uh, the return to the equilibrium. And therefore you will have a, a good measurement in 10 milliseconds typically. And then you will have this tail that you need in order to integrate fully the full thermalization. Uh, so the, that's an inconvenient, they are slow, and they are high impedance, and um, the um, but this is this is one way to measure phonon. But we, we should be more precise about what we call phonons. There, are, I, I would say there are 
a simple way to say it, there are three different kinds of phonons. You have phonons that you create right at the moment of the impact or very soon after in the, the few na nanosecond while the charge is still being trapped. These are the earliest phonons keep the memory of what was the momentum of the initial particle and 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 uh, and, the, and therefore it will be tempting to try to measure these phonons because they have a position and 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 and, and they know where the initial particle comes from the only thing is that these high energy phonons have very short path length they they travel if uh, it uh, depend on the, on the temperature on the material and the purity of the system but uh, it's uh, barely uh, minim uh, millimeters. So therefore, uh, you cannot use that to um, to have a good position dependence in a big uh, detector. These high energy phonons rapidly degrade to lower energy phonons, and there and then you have intermediate uh, intermediate energy. Uh, these are called ballistic. Why? Because since they are lower energy. Their cross section of interaction with with uh, the interaction are the, the the phonon interact with the imperfection of the of the the lattice so impurities defect and also what's on the surface which is not germanium that that this this destruction will break the phonons to lower energy phonons but since they are lower energy they can they they have smaller cross section of interaction they have longer path length and therefore they can spread out in the entire detector. Uh, this, these ballistic phonons are called ballistic because it just goes straight until they hit the, the wall and then they bounce and, 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 and they can bounce many times. So they are not position dependent. They, they, they span the entire, they completely forget about the initial position of your uh, initial momentum. Uh, and they, they are few tens of microsecond of lifetime. So therefore you can, uh, you, you, if you can detect them, you have, you have, you have, then you have a faster detector than the millisecond I just described earlier. And then when you, and then it's only one D the degrade in the millisecond, in the millisecond uh, time scale that you will have the thermal phonon that we just described earlier. So quite early people have thought that maybe instead of waiting for everything to terminalize, maybe you should have a detector which, which looks at ballistic phonons. Um, uh, Schulz, can I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, so th th there's a lot of um, uh, recent discussion, mostly among theorists, of exciting acoustic and optical phonons. So wh wh where do they fit in this whole scheme here? And could you say a few words what they really are? Yes. Um, right now, I, the way I presented it, the only way you can produce phonons is either to hit a to to hit directly a nucleus or to hit uh, uh, and to or to create a free uh, electron hole pair. But uh, you can um, uh, you can excite. A, a crystal, for instance, the crystal is never perfect. You will have low-lying state that are inside the gap, and therefore, when when you you interact with that, you can create phonons. Um, so a crude way would say that uh, if you you deposit energy without creating an electron hole pair, uh, well, well, yeah, it's possible to deposit energy in a crystal without creating uh, ionization. It's just that. The, the electron is, is, you could say that the electron is, is just going, um, is, uh, well, to be very crude, you could say it's, it's immediately reabsorbed or uh, neutralized, but you, you, you can create states that don't uh, create ionization. And these are lower energy state. So therefore, you, you, as I said, you, you, your phonons, your basic energy of your phonons could be as low as a, a fraction, a fraction of a milli electron volt. You say, and you can, if you can have a mechanism to to, to deposit it, you 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 just have to find the right um, absorber that has free degrees of freedom that can be easily ex excited with such low. Um, uh, excitation. So, um, in the previous yeah, talk, think, there was, there, there, you know, 
I, I think I'm just confused. Uh, what is the phone on landscape? Uh, we seem to have a lot of different kinds of phonons here. So for for a non condensed matter physicist, I'm, uh... yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, the that the message is that yes, when you talk about phonon, be very careful because you have thermal phonons, which is just temperature. It's and 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 you have initial phonons that have memory of, of what's happening and, and then you have a well phonons are associated to degrees of freedom so in a crystal where you only have the vibration of a just straight uh, system of um, a system of vibrating nucleus around uh, in equilibrium then these restrict the number of phonons but i guess in more complex system you have other degrees of freedom and then you have excitation of these collective excitation of the system that will create uh, excitant and, and uh, objects that end in on and don't correspond to a natural particle but correspond to collective excitation. And uh, these have, and again, these can be thermalized or not. And uh, you have quite a huge landscape. So if you, it's, no, it's a good thing to be afraid of phonons. It's it's a um, it's it's quite a I wasn't full, a rich thanks landscape. For, <laughs> thanks for putting this perspective on it. Thank you. Okay. So um, now coming back to thermal phonons, here's uh, when I said that these were limited. It's we've, we've in the advice we push a, pushed a little bit how we could improve. Uh, the sensitivity of the phono of just simple GNTD detector. And um, uh, I will not have time to talk about it. Well, um, the simple system, even the, the detection with the NTD is not as straight as just E equal, uh, delta T equal E over C because what we've just described so far was just one thermal bath and one sensor uh, and one absorber. But in order to fully understand how the pulse looks like and how, how good is your sensitivity, you have to take into account that the sensor itself is also part of the system. And therefore, uh, you have to take into account the thermalization of the, and the, the flow of, of heat in the system where you have an absorber, but your sensor also is, is one part of the system that has its own degrees of freedom. And uh, in the, uh, the NTD sensor, you have basically two separate degrees of freedom, which is the, the phonon or the lattice of the NTD. And then the electron of the NTD has to be considered separately for the reason that ultimately what you measure is the resistance and the resistance depends on the temperature of the electrons. And the electrons are heated up because you are flowing a, a, a current there. But the electrons will, be, tend to, will tend to be warmer than the rest of the NTD. You have a, a, a conduction, they, they are coupled, but you have to take into account this coupling between the phonon in the, in the NTD and the, the, the temperature of the electron the temperature of the phonons in the NTD, and of course the temperature of the phonon in the absorber. So, so that's why you get not just a, a two, uh, a, one exponential decay coming from this coupling here. You get a, a couple of different times. This, this model is more complicated because here's the detector where, where we have two NTD glues on both sides. And we consider that maybe the detector is coupled to some parasitic and, and, and and therefore, the physics of NTD looks simple, but it can be made more complicated if you really, really want to optimize how it works. So let's go back to uh, the uh, uh, sensor that would be sensitive to, um, uh, to a thermal phonon. This is what is used in CREST and CDMS. And this is a transi transition edge uh, sensor. So instead of, of uh, having a, a resistance versus temperature curve that goes down like the NTD, you have a transition between a superconducting state and uh, a tungsten superconducting state 
and it has a transition at some temperature that you choose. Uh, typically, in the in the, it, it depends, and the temperature depends on the experiment. Uh, in CDMS, they, they, it's a bit higher. They're trying to get it down from 50 to uh, 20 millik. In, in CRES, it can be lower than, than this uh, uh, 18 millik here, shown here as an example. And since you have a dependence of the resistance on the temperature, then you have what you need to have a sensor. And this here can be pretty steep. And the other advantage is that you don't need to go to a transition to high impedance. You just need to have a transition to a fraction of home. And therefore you have a low, um, you have a low impedance system where uh, the trick is that you, you establish a current loop um, and uh, the signal is the variation of the current. Since the slope here is diff if you want to have a positive, uh, 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 um, a good sign in the feedback of uh, when you have a particle that comes in, it, it, it increases the resistance and you don't want this to, to diverge by this thing uh, eating up your detector even further and, and then uh, uh, going, uh, diverging. So you, you, uh, these detectors are usually biased at constant uh, at constant bias. And then the, the measurement is just the variation of current measure through uh, squid loop. And this is a very sharp transition. And uh, in principle, you, 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 get a, uh, you should be able to get a better sensitivity. Uh, of course, the trick is that uh, you have to detect phonons. So instead of waiting for the, de the detector to terminalize, you, you must actively try to get phonons without disturbing too much their population. So uh, usually the transition edge is a small piece of, of, uh, of a tungsten. And in order to trap more phonons, as, as many phonons as possible, you, you will have a, an aluminum collector, which has a, a bigger surface. And um, those phonons are trapped in this, uh, uh, in, in the in breaking Cooper pairs in the aluminum uh, phonon uh, catcher. And uh, this diffuse to the uh, transition edge, and that's where you get the measurement. So this is a bit more complex, but in principle, you get a better resolution out of that. And uh, since you're sensitive to directly the phonons, in principle, you're, you, you're not dependent on the crystal heat capacity. And, and the really a big advantage is this is a faster measurement. Uh, this is an example, an actual uh, TES. So the TES uh, should uh, put, put this TES is, uh, these are the aluminum fins. So most of the thing you see here is just the aluminum fin uh, catching and the, and the TES. Uh, I had the TES marked on, on the other slide, but that one has disappeared. Um, I have other pictures. And, and so it's a small, it, it, okay, I gave the impression that uh, the TS needs to be very big in order to, um, to catch as many phon phonons as possible. Here in Crest with, with small, relatively small phonons, the size is optimized to, uh, to, to not to perturb too much the population, the lifetime of the, of the, of the phonons, but just catch enough of them to have a, a significant signal. And um, so this is another here on a bigger detector, you will have bigger um, aluminum, um, aluminum phonon collectors. And, uh, and CREST on, with these detect, this is a more, uh, more recent press detector are, are, are smaller. And that, that uh, despite the fact that in principle, phonon collection, and it, it, is, is not sensitive to the capacitance, but it's still a question of how much surface you cover and so on. So it was, uh, Crest was able with a smaller detector to get much better to have a, um, a threshold, go down to threshold as low as 30 EV, uh, just a resolution of few EV on 25 gram system, which, which uh, are fine to detect um, the, um, the 
low mass WIMP because you really need to have such low threshold to, to detect thing. And this is a threshold on total energies, no quenching, so it's a quite nice threshold. In the CDMS, uh, they wanted to really benefit from the position dependence that you can get out of these detector. And therefore, they have covered uh, the entire surface with a network of thousands of, of TES changed chain together and, and read uh, uh, as a chain. And by um, these are their old detector where the, the, the thousands of, of uh, the 440, 40S in each quarter were, were linked at, in quarter. Uh, they've done a design where they follow a spiral that will come back, uh, uh, the, the, use TV, the use for that will come back when you look, when we talk about ionization. And by looking at the difference between the signal in the four three in the four the three, the three thirds and the guard ring here, which prevent which attacks very efficiently deposit that come from the side, uh, they can have a position dependence. They find a clear uh, fiducial volume. Uh, so it's a more complex device, but it gives you more information. Now, scintillation, I think I will not have time to, if I want to cover a bit more ionization. Um, ionization can get a bit more complicated because ionization is just not looking at photons coming out, but um, it can go back. Uh, once a photon is emitted and detected, it goes out of the system. And if you want to have a detector with ionization, so you have electrodes on top, on the bottom, you collect, and um, uh, you will have a, a ionization uh, signal, which will be a, sig a, number, a certain number of pair. I, I hear I ignore for a moment uh, charge. I suppose that all the charge created are collected for simplicity. And in germanium, this, uh, the number of pair is, if E recoil is above 10 to 20 EV, this is simply the energy of the recoil divided by three that gives you the number of pair that you have. And this will be your ionization. So if you calibrate your signal in KeV using a gamma ray source, you will have a KeV, a measurement of the number of pair that will be expressed instead of KeV, equivalent electron. But basically you're just measuring pairs. Now for the heat, you say, okay, I will just measure the total energy, but the total energy here will be the energy of the recoil, the basic recoil that created the, the, the pairs. But at the same time, you have created a certain number of electron hole pair, and you will make them drift through a potential V. That's a V here is the, the bias between the two electrodes. So you will do a work, and uh, you would, and, and even though you're at low temperature, you will have something equivalent to Joule effect, just the heating, due to the fact that you just uh, you drag. You, we talk about drifting the charge, but in reality, we drag them because the, the charge complete the, the electron keep on uh, uh, interacting with phonons as they are drifting. So by the by this interaction with with phonons, that means that each time you want to make an electron move, uh, even though it's low temperature and, and low speed and all, and the, the, it will still interact with phonons and therefore it will be stopped by the phonons and continuously you do a work with your, your potential here, produce a work, and this work is lost into heating your detector. So you have uh, this effect is called in, in Cold detector, Neganov Trofinor Kluf effect, NTL. So this in fact is not, is not a problem because when you think of it, it just adds to your to your to your uh, signal. Instead of having just the initial required energy, you add something to it. And uh, and the 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 resolution of the measurement is is on the uh, it, is, uh, it will not be affected too much. If you don't heat too much and don't create too much extra heat uh, continuously, then by this amplification just gives you more gain without more noise. 
So if you combine this measurement with the the the, the ionization that you uh, the, the the number of pair that you translate into an ionization energy, then you will see that the electron recoil will have more ionization for an equal number of heat energy than the nuclear recoil because the nuclear recoil will create something like four to five times less number of, of charge per deposit energy. And then you see this effect. Uh, you see also that in, in these detectors, sometimes you will have the uh, heat only event, but this is a topic we I won't have time to discuss much here. So with this, you have a clear separation. Um, uh, as exercise, I, I show how from these two measurements of ionization and total energy, you can go back to the initial recoil energy and the ionization over recoil, the, the, the quenching here. And for photon, you can get a very clean measurement. Uh, and when you have a nuclear recoil, uh, uh, americium barium source that create nuclear recoil, you will have, a, a night, we will populate this band of nuclear recoil. These here are not defect, are just uh, when you combine a new, uh, when you have an N gamma on germanium, you create these elastic state that are a linear combination of photon and a nuclear recoil. Therefore, you get these well defined band at discrete states. So you can do a precise measurement of exactly what energy you have and, and what is the quenching event, event by event. Now, the, the limitation of this technique is that. Uh, uh, the, your perfect detector stops to be a perfect detector at, at the edge because a crystal stops to be a crystal at, 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 at its surface, which means that you, you have lots of trap on the surface and also you, have, you will have an electrode, you will have an interface. Sometimes you have, a, a, you ha you have to have a dead layer in order to, 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 uh, to redeposit your electrode. So therefore, you will tend to have a dead layer and other and, and lots of trapping sites that will degrade your charge measurement. Uh, uh, and here you can check that by putting a beta source close to your, to your detector. And you see that your, your electron recoils, th these are producing electron recoil, but they are degraded because they are coming on the surface where your detector doesn't work well. The charge collection is poor because you're in the bad region. Uh, the way to um, to uh, alleviate that is uh, well, if you have a detector with uh, phonon, uh, CDMS was able to um, separate uh, the population of, of nuclear recoil and and uh, electron recoil by using not the ionization but the fact that uh, the um, the, the when you look at atomal phonon, the interaction of, of, of the phonon created in the loop negative process is different from the process of, uh, of a primary electron. And therefore, when you look at the time structure of the, um, you have a timing parameter. And when you look at the time structure at the same time as the ionization yield, you can separate uh, surface beta from uh, which which have a bad ionization yield from uh, nuclear recoil that have a lower ionization yield, but um, uh, but but uh, not uh, from uh, the fact that they are in the surface. So this is one way to uh, to get around the problem of of uh, not having a good ionization resolution on the surface. But a better way was 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 uh, found uh, a couple of years ago by by realizing that. What what thing one thing you could do is to instead of having a flat electrode on the top, you could have concentric rings of electrode with alternate potential, and uh, so you would have two sets of rings at the top. They are daisy chain on the top, and then two set uh, and two sets of ring below. One of uh, the C one collector one is that uh, let's put it at plus four volts, and the other one at minus four volts. Uh, these are biggest uh, difference in bias throughout all the electrode. And then we put veto electrode interleave between these collecting electrode. And we put them at a smaller but opposite sign bias. 
what happens is that if, uh, if you are very close to the surface, a charge which is very close to the surface will see the, the electric field between adjacent electrodes. And therefore, the charge will be collected just on one side. Same thing here. The charge deposited here will, de will be collected in the electrode on both sides. But a charge that is somewhere in this huge volume, uh, see, as a, see that the, the, the field line go from one plus four volt electrode to another minus four volt electrode. So all the events in the fiducial volume will be collected on one side for one type of charge and the other sign of charge will be collected on the other side. So with this electrode scheme, you have a, a detector where if you have an uh, interaction in the bulk, you should have ionization side, uh, uh, ionization signal on both sides and uh, none on the veto electrode, which act also act as grid. Well, if, the, if you have signal on the veto electrode, it means that the signal come from the first millimeter. Um, so this is a, a, a the phase detector where this, this, this scheme covers the entire surface of the detector even the side. In super CDMS, um, they patterned their array of TES in order to, produce, to uh, make this veto being the ground TES. And then between the TES, you have the electrode that will be uh, switch, uh, pol uh, pol uh, polarized to some uh, uh, couple of volts on one side and yeah, negative on the other side. So they have the same effect. They said it doesn't cover the center, but that's why they have the phonon sensor identifying what happens on the side. And this is a quite good way to reject surface. This is, uh, if you expose the uh, device detector to a lead 210 source producing high energy beta, low energy beta, and even alphas and, and uh, lead recoils, all these are rejected just by asking that no charge should be uh, seen on the veto electrode and you, you have a very efficient um, rejection. Um, there's also the added bonus that uh, this scheme makes a grid like in the big TPC, genome TPC, so that helps for uh, the, the, having a, a high field at the surface. So therefore the charge collection on the surface is, is better because you have a high field between very close by uh, electrodes. Uh, and um, and so the the but the, the 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 physics of the charge transportation in in semiconductor is even more, at low temperature is even more complex than that because um, for instance you've been told that a a, a a field line for instance you have a field line from here to here. And therefore, the field line is what the charge follow when they 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 they, 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 they move up and down in the detector. Now, where when you're at twenty milli k, uh, this is no longer true because the energy, the kinetic energy of uh, is, is is and is um, and we're operating at such low field not to heat the detector that uh, the the electron, as they travel, they're sensitive to the fact that you have valleys here and they, they will tend to migrate along the valley. And when you're at very low temperature, then the electron will just follow the valley, one valley instead of, of, of going straight up. So you will say, wait, wait a minute, what happens if a charge is drifting in the de detector without following a field line? Does it change all the equation? The answer at the end, everything is fine. You, you go back to the simple model, but uh, it, it, it's, it goes back to the simple model because of uh, uh, not very subtle cancellations. Now with ionization, it's not, no, ionization is not over. You can do something else. If you really want to go down to low threshold, instead of trying to do the uh, nuclear recoil, the, um, the uh, of, of, of biasing your detector in order to select, to reject surface events, what you can do is accept your surface background, but go for the low threshold. And the idea is that you have a, as long as you don't heat up the crystal, you can crank up the bias on your detector and you will gain 
in, in, in the signal and the noise in principle will remain the same, which means that if you operate the same detector at increasing voltage, then in terms of energy resolution on the normalized, on where the, the calibration peak, the, la, the calibration line here, your resolution in KEV equivalent electron goes down. And therefore you have a measurement of charge, but with the heat channel. The, the idea is, is, is so on said that, that if uh, you, uh, if we come back to the, the equation that was saying that uh, the, the heat signal is, is uh, the, the energy recoil plus number of pairs times V, it means that if V is very large, the initial energy is very, is negligible. And therefore what you see is that your, your thermal signal will just be the measurement of, of the fact that you have measured one times 100 volts or two times two charge times 100 volts or three times 100 volts. So instead of having a continuous spectrum at low energy, you will have a, a amplification of a factor in germanium, it's one plus V over three. So you have a factor of 33 uh, amplification of the heat if you can apply 100 volts. So, and, and therefore in terms of detecting charge, you have 32 ta 33 times better energy uh, charge resolution on the heat signal. Uh, and the cost of that is of course that now the, if you look at ionization versus heat, then the ionization signal, the heat signal is just at high voltage, just identical to the uh, ionization because you measure exactly the same thing twice, except that you measure it with a much better resolution than what you had, what you had before. Here there's a zoom at 90 volts, you have a hundred EV uh, resolution while you have something, a, a poor one, EV, uh, 1K EV resolution when you were at low bias. And then with the same detector, you can reach a resolution, uh, a threshold, or in this case, 0.2 EV, uh, 0.2 KV threshold with this trick. And um, now this is the discussion about how low can you go and what happens uh, with this, this approximation. Does it break down the fact that um, in principle, in a solid state detector, uh, to create one electron hole pair, you just need the gap energy. So, so the, you have to, the, this is a, maybe a long discussion to explain that the fact that the gap is 0 0.73 V means that the minimum energy to, for an electron to be detected and create one electron hole pair is 0 0.7 EV. This three EV is an average when you have a high energy excitation and then you, you try to uh, distribute this energy among, amongst many electrons. So there's a transition between the regime where uh, the number of, of, uh, of charge will, will, be, will follow this rule that num the, the energy, the number of charge is the energy divided by 3V. This is the, this line here, but at low energy, eventually, the uh, the number of, of quantum you put the, the number of of of, uh, full of charge you create the electron pair you create will be one down to the uh, the, the the gap and then after the gap you you have a, z a chance zero of of uh, of the, of, um, of uh, creating a pair and here the fact that this probability is not one this is our room temperature measurement but at low temperature it should be the same the fact that you have a, a discrepancy between the fact that here the quantum efficiency to create uh, here you can detect a, you can detect some energy even though you don't always create a, a pair you create uh, an electron pair only in 60 percent of the case and the rest will be exciton. And so exciton are also present at low energy. They're important to uh, understand the, the, the signal. So the best example of the application of this method is in the HVA detector where of CDMS, where they clearly see the peak corresponding to one, two, three, and four electrons. And, and, and uh, they, they have a resolution, which is a fraction of a, of a pair. Um, in the device, we tried that, uh, but with a bigger detector, the detector using 
in the in CDMS was a, a one gram silicon crystal. Uh, for dark matter search, you still want to try to get as large mass as possible uh, because it, it shell, you get some shell shielding and also the detector was operated at, at LSM. And uh, even though it, with this detector, uh, you don't have the resolution to resolve the one, two or three electron pair. Uh, we, you have to calibrate it at high energy, and uh, we later checked that the germanium is indeed uh, sensitive to, to these pair, but here you are nominated by the, the, the most probably the, uh, the, the readout noise that prevents you from, from really looking at uh, one electron, but you can put upper limit because you're in low uh, radioactive environment, and in fact this approach, even though you don't see the peak uh, you um, you uh, you can set a slightly better limit than what CDMS did, but of course the best thing is to have such detector here and operate them in low background condition and try to get uh, a decent mass and 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 check that you could you understand all your backgrounds. Okay, so uh, okay in the last few minutes, okay I talked about uh, cooling down detectors. Uh, one thing that one has to keep in mind is that all these detectors must be installed in this environment, uh, which is a, called a dilution refrigerator, which is in reality a series of different refrigerator that cooled. Uh, you have a you you use in, in the traditionally you would use a first stage uh, liquid helium to cool one stage at 4K, and then you would pump on the helium in order to go from 4K to 1.4K, just by, by the, 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 the detente on when you pump on, on, on the gas. And then uh, you, you do the same trick of pumping, a but now in a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4, and by the magic of thermodynamics that I don't have to explain here, uh, this this is more efficient at cooling you down at 10 millik. But it, so a, a dilution refrigerator is just a series of, of two or three refrigerator, each one cooling the other one. And uh, this is maybe one of the difficulty of the, the, the technique is that you must make the detector work. Uh, but the good thing is that the cryogenics, the, a very good material for making cryostat uh, is a, uh, copper and copper can be very clean in, in terms of radioactivity. So being in the copper environment is not, it's, it's not detrimental to get a good, uh, good uh, uh, backgrounds in terms of radioactivity. Now, a more recent development in the coming years, we've been able to simplify the operation by, by, by skipping the first two, replacing the first two stage by just one pulse tube thermal machine. So you get rid of two refrigerator uh, with uh, with filling of helium and pumping on helium by just having a, a switch that you you just turn on your machine. Uh, this just came recently because uh, these pulse tube are, are uh, pulsing; they are making vibration, and your detector is sensitive to any kind of energy, including vibration. So. Uh, the revolution was how you could decouple these pulse tube from the, the frame of your detector and from vibration. So these are pictures of the kind of uh, facilities where you have to install the detector are relatively small compared to the entire environment. You, uh, is here is also the strategy of you, 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 your electronic has to be shielded in Germany, in Edelweiss, we, we put the maximum of the electronic be below a very thick a Roman lead uh, uh, piece of, of lead in order to uh, control uh, radioactivity. But there are others solution. This is a, a, a scheme of the uh, Kress Kreistat. Um, most of it, in fact, when you look at it, most of it is the shielding. And then the Kreistat is, is you have the dilution unit here uh, separated by lead shielding and then you have a, uh, the, the, the coal is communicated through this long uh, copper neck and then you have the payload here and then you have all the shielding that we discussed briefly before. Uh, 
And this is the CDMS design. So the detectors are here. You have all the shielding and all the electronic is pushed as far away in this, in this unit here. And then you have the different level of shielding. So maybe just for conclusion, uh, I did not show any results. I mean, these detectors are, are very effective at probing very low mass. And they, they, their goal is really to, to this region with the super CDMS HV go, uh, planning to, to, to get in this, this region in, in, in Snow Lab. And uh, Crest and Edelweiss do developing new detectors in order, smaller detector to, to address this region be, instead of, of, of uh, their conventional detector uh, of 10 years ago that were more tuned to, to this region here. But uh, with NTL amplification uh, in the uh, CDMS and Edelweiss, we, we, we get results that are interesting for the search of interaction with electrons. Uh, right now, since CE is a better background, uh, and uh, but NLVS and uh, in, in the CDMS are, are still developing uh, new new technique. And in, here with germanium, you see that with germanium, with the smaller gap than silicon, you get a little bit of edge in in looking at probing the very lowest mass here. But uh, okay, you have to make your detector work as well as as as, as a CCD in order to, uh, to really uh, get the benefit of that. Okay, so that, uh, that completes my presentation. Um,